Once upon a time, there was a game series called Shin Megami Tensei. This was an RPG series full of spooky ghosty boys and the angsty teens who commanded them. These titles were super hardcore role-playing games, and they were best known for their deep lore and wild and wacky demons. These weren't baby RPGs, these were big boy RPGs. Then one day, a spin-off title called Persona was released, and this game was also super hardcore for a niche audience. But then they made Persona 2. In fact, they made two of them. And okay, those games are also super hardcore titles, but then they made Persona 3, and this hardcore spin-off series became a little less hardcore. Well, that's what the hardcore fans would say, at least. The Persona games were a little bit more mainstream than the Shin Megami Tensei titles, and these spin-offs started getting their own spin-offs. Persona 3 Thess, Persona 4, The Dancing One, Persona 4, The Fighting One, Persona 3 and 5, The Other Dancing Ones, Persona 5, The Dynasty Warriors One, and eventually, Persona 5, The Tactics One. And that's what we're reviewing today, because you know I love tactics and strategy games. Just ignore all of the dungeon crawlers and action games I've been reviewing lately. This game has a square grid map, and terrain, and enemies strategically placed. Sure, it's a little bit more like XCOM and less like Shining Force than I'd want, but I'm totally fine with that. So join me, Richard from RPG Fortress, today for Persona 5 Tactica and Is This Game Hardcore or Hard Snore? <coughs> Run the intro. Persona 5 Tactica is a spin-off of the outrageously popular Persona 5. It was released in the year of our lore 2023 for PC, Switch, PlayStation 4 and 5, Xbox Series, and probably something else that I'm forgetting. It's just on all of the most recent stuff, okay? It was developed by P Studio and published by Sega slash Atlas, depending on the region. Tactica is the fifth, I think, spin-off of Persona 5 and is a tactics RPG. The previous spin-offs were Persona 5 Dancing in Starlight, a rhythm game, Persona 5 Strikers, a Dynasty Warriors style game, Persona Q2, a dungeon crawler, and Persona 5 China Only Edition. I think it's a mobile game, but I'm not really quite sure as I can't play it myself, so I've kind of glossed over the details. So when going into Tactica saying, why a tactics game? Well, you can't say that the Persona people don't mind trying something new. Producer Kasuhi Sawada said that they wanted to expand the SMT franchise into the realm of SRPGs, but mate, this isn't the first tactics game with the name SMT slapped on it. We've got Devil Survivor 1 and 2 for the DS slash 3DS, two of my absolute favorite SMT titles, also very unique takes on the genre. Also, we have Majin Tensei, but don't talk about that game. The game's director, Naoya Maeda, said that he wanted the game to be easily accessible for people who are new to SRPGs, and yeah, I think they succeeded. The early game does a good job of holding your hand and spoon-feeding you little drops of tactics juice at an inviting clip. That being said, while the early game is pretty easy, some of the later stages are pretty wild. The game introduces a controversial art style, which I have to say, I'm fine with. The characters have this SD look that it's not too different from the Q games on the 3DS, but the limbs are long and lanky, and I guess that's why people are grumpy. But man, it's a spin-off game, so a slightly different, or even radically different art style, I think at least, is fine. The story of Persona 5 Tactica shocked me with how good it actually is. Seriously, I straight up enjoyed it. I even shed a couple of cheeky little tears during the end credits. The game tells the story of, let me start this off by saying, after finishing the game, the Phantom Thieves feel like they are kind of playing second fiddle to the new characters, Kasukabi Toshiro and Arena. This might make or break it for some people. Don't get me wrong, the Phantom Thieves are, they're all central to the story, but the story itself is 
essentially that of Toshiro and Arena. The story starts innocently enough with our plucky little phantom thieves hanging out in LeBlanc seemingly just at some random point during the events of Persona 5. While horsing around and trying to get a bit of relaxation in, a story about a missing politician named Kasakabe Toshiro pops up on the TV. While postulating what this is about, our team is isekai'd right into another realm. The people of this world are being dominated by a domineering dominatrix Lady Dimitrescu-sized Dommy Mommy named Marie. Her and her soldiers are keeping the populace in order with an iron fist, and needless to say, the citizens don't like this. Marie uses her mind control to take over most of the Phantom Thieves and forces them to join her forces. This is when our new heroine, Arena, enters the scene, spear in hand, rebellion in her heart. Arena reveals herself to be a rebel who has been fighting against Marie for some time now, and this is the role that Arena plays throughout the game. She is the voice of dissent fighting against the tyrants of all four chapters. While pushing forward, Arena and the Phantom Thieves eventually rescue a man locked in Marie's dungeon because, of course, Dommy Mommy has a dungey dungeon. This seemingly random man turns out to be the missing Kasukabe Toshiro, the missing politician. But why is he in the Isekai world? In the Isekai dungeon? And why is he such a whiny whinger? Moving forward, the story slowly starts to unravel. These vast isekai worlds are essentially Toshiro's palace, and the tyrants we fight are the manifestations of those in the real world who are trying to control Toshiro. Toshiro's campaign being that of Prime Minister, there are several manipulators who want to control him and use him as a puppet for their own gain. It's all very well done, to be completely honest. The story of a man being manipulated in the name of politics, and the manifestation of his rebellion against these villains taking the form of Arena. Like I said, this story is basically the story of Toshiro and Arena. They both have incredibly well-realized arcs and their growth throughout the story is great. The Phantom Thieves don't really get their own story arcs and plot points, they're just there. They're wonderful characters and it's nice to see them again, but part of me wanted some sort of character development for them. Then again, this being a spin-off taking place during the story of P5, I can see how hard that would have been. Overall, the story is great, the new characters are well done, and it's just great to see the Phantom Thieves once again. The gameplay in Persona 5 Tactica is a lot more XCOM than Shining Force. Combat takes place on a giant square grid map with a focus on taking cover during combat lest ye get shot to death. This is fine. I like XCOM just fine. I was just hoping that this would be a bit more of a traditional SRPG, but it's, it's fine. Seriously, I'm only just a a little bit salty. Combat involves stalking around maps and defeating dudes through shooty guns, personas, and trinity attacks. Guns are upgraded from the shop and later on through the forge in the velvet room, more on that later. Personas are earned by finishing battles, yes that's it. And trinity attacks are kind of the thing with this game. During combat, you're able to knock enemies down, which starts the trinity attack. As you run around the battlefield attacking enemies, sometimes you will hit their weak spot and knock them prone. When you do this, you'll get the familiar to SMT fans one more, which in this game acts as giving that character another turn. When the enemy is prone, you can surround him with your three party members and engage in a a trinity attack, which looks like a giant flaming Dorito. Your party then piles on top of the prone foe for big damage. The real fun thing is that any other enemies trapped inside this Dorito of Hellfire will also take this damage. Depending on where your guys are standing, you can hit huge piles of enemies and in some instances every single enemy on the field. Very cool. Now, after playing probably four-fifths of the game with just three party members, Toshiro joins as a fourth battle unit. This sudden additional unit greatly changes how battles progress. Toshiro is a little bit different from your other units. He doesn't get a gun, he doesn't get skills, and he can't equip an additional persona. He doesn't act in Dorito attacks, but he can start them off if he knocks an enemy prone. 
This is the best part of what Toshiro can do, getting that crucial first attack on an enemy allowing one of your other three proper units to get a one more and then navigate to start a Dorito attack. Toshiro makes getting these Trinity attacks incredibly easy. Due to his presence, you will be whipping out Dorito attacks just about every single turn. This late game update is awesome. This did just enough to make the late game doldrums vanish. The game features a simple but fun skill system. You earn skill points from finishing battles, completing quests, and watching talk segments. You then use these points to unlock skills on a board, and some of the stronger skills are locked behind progression. Really simple, really fun. The quest system is a little bit weird, but overall I do like it. So, the game doesn't have quests in the WOW sense of the word. What the quests actually are, are kind of these little puzzle maps. These quests are unlocked a couple of times per battle after finishing standard story battles. These quests start with your characters having a brief dialogue to set the scene, you know, Persona 5 Bants. Then you'll have to finish the map's objectives in X amount of turns to succeed. But the requisites are usually pretty tough, meaning you'll need to kind of figure out the solutions to succeed in time. Kill X goblins in three turns sounds easy enough until you realize it's not. But once you succeed in figuring out the solution and you win, your characters will get a stack of skill points. Very cool stuff. The Velvet Room, of course, is back and has all of the bells and whistles that you're used to if you've played literally any other Persona game. You can fuse Personas to create new ones, you can do special fusions for super special Personas, you can record them in the Compendium, and you can summon them from the Compendium for a price. Sometimes a high price. Eventually, Lavenza will gain the ability to not just forge you Personas, but also forge you new guns. This is actually pretty fun, if I'm going to be honest. It's just like fusing two Personas personas into a new persona, but you're actually fusing two personas into a fucking gun. These weapons are also pretty powerful and usually have some sort of status ailment attached to them. Very, very helpful stuff. All right, let's talk about the DLC. It's a little bit fucked up. The DLC, Repaint Your Heart, has the characters Akechi and Kasumi locked into it, and it's like 20 bucks. I went into it thinking, okay, the DLC chapter is only 20 bucks, and I'll get to unlock these two characters in the main game. No. The DLC chapter is three hours. Akechi and Kasumi are only playable in the main game in New Game Plus, and they don't interact with the story at all. They are just battle-only characters. I know DLC will always be contentious, but it's a part of games now. It has been for like 15 years, but so many devs still stumble over its implementation. And P5T stumbles. This DLC chapter really should have been included in the main game along with Akechi and Kasumi, but the reality is the DLC is just so weirdly implemented. It almost feels like it should be its own $10 standalone title, but it's not. You're paying 60 or 70 or 80 bucks or whatever for the main game, and then you are paying 20 bucks on top of it for the DLC, which is essentially a self-contained story. And yeah, I get that. You bought the DLC, you are contributing to the problem, is an argument, but there are hundreds of thousands of people going to do the same thing. I wanted to look at all of the content for this video, so I had to get it. Yes, yes, bring on the logical fallacy arguments, it's fine. But the DLC at least has its own vibe. While it should have been part of the main game, it at least has its own thing going on. Different party, different villains, and a Splatoon-esque battle system. The DLC's self-contained story is pretty good, all whinging and whining aside. You play as Joker, Akechi, and Kasumi who meet up all on accident in a random alleyway. There has been an outbreak of graffiti lately, and boom, while discussing this, the trio are isekai'd into another world. A world of gray streets and vibrant graffiti. Turns out a villain named Guernica has been oppressing the denizens of this realm. You meet a young girl in a mouse costume who can teleport through her own graffiti. She explains that we have to stop the bad guy, yada yada, and you set out to stop Guernica. It plays pretty much like the standard game with some truncated mechanics, no velvet room, no additional characters, etc. And the story is pretty good. It feeds on the main story's themes of manipulation and rebellion. 
Rebellion. And yeah, the DLC does contain this bizarre Splatoon-esque mechanic where you can blow up paint cans and change the paint color of the surrounding area. Enemies can't act in your paint and you can't act in theirs. It's pretty fun, but it, it definitely caught me off guard. Persona 5 Tactica is a bizarre but fun spin-off of Persona 5. I wasn't sure what to expect. I like the Persona games, but I knew the spin-offs are all a little bit weird. I was hoping for a hardcore tactical romp, but I ended up with an XCOM style of gameplay. This game was looking to be a complete grab bag of different ideas and systems, and it kinda is, but I also kinda don't care. This game story is really the standout for me. I was not expecting such a well-realized story with well-defined characters, but that's exactly what I got. I was truly expecting a throwaway story, but I got something compelling, something that made me feel genuine emotion. I will never forget that last scene after the credits. The gameplay is great fun, even though it wasn't what I really wanted. But after a few battles, I was cranking out Dorito attacks and smashing my brain cells together to try to find the best and most explosive ways to blow up the baddies. And all of the stuff that happened in between battles was also great fun. It's always a delight to complete your Persona compendium, even if this time around the Personas are mostly just flat JPEGs. While I definitely don't think Persona 5 Tactica is for everybody, I think that SRPG fans will find some excitement in this title, and I also think that the people who are after just good storytelling will also appreciate Persona 5 Tactica. Hey, 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 it's the end of yet another video. My friends, thank you for taking the time to watch my silly little video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Have you ever played Persona 5 Tactica? Did you enjoy it? Do you hate the limbs? Do you love Futaba drinking curry straight from a gravy boat? Let me know in the comments below. Now, ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between and beyond, this is the part of the video where I politely ask you for social engagement. Please like, share, subscribe, comment, check out Discord, check out Patreon, buy a shirt, buy an album, get isekai'd, attack some goblins with Doritos, fight back against tyrants, Complete 99% of the compendium and struggle to figure out how to fuse Messiah. For RPG Fortress, my name is Richard. See you next time, and don't forget to hug Morgana. Goodbye.